Squatting every day has been a buzz term for as long as I've been lifting. It was an often talked about but never witnessed approach to training where an individual would squat seven days per week, 365 days per year. The primary inspiration is the Bulgarian weightlifting system, pioneered by Ivan Abijev. The methods of Ivan, the butcher as he was known, produced 12 Olympic medals and 57 world champions, and that's from a country the size of New York City. Olympic lifting as a sport was already high frequency to begin with. Success in the sport requires technical precision and lightning speed, and that is best developed with as much practice as possible, similar to the training for any other athletic quality. But the traditional approach used a rotation of special exercises and scheduled training to periodize segments. The Soviet system emphasized multiple reps, multiple percentage ranges, and there was a fixation on technical execution. This was structured under the type of rigid top-down systems that the Soviet Union was known for. As Greg Knuckles of Stronger by Science wrote in his article detailing the history and theory behind periodization, the Soviets in the Stalin era loved top-down long-term planning. The original impetus behind periodization was simply the Soviet long-term top-down planning fetish applied to sport. It can't be stressed strongly enough that they didn't have data to show that long-term planning produced better results than shorter-term planning. It was simply a deeply embedded cultural assumption that such endeavors were inherently superior. So in comes Abhijiev into this rigid top-down structure, and it's his goal to stand out. Well, when you have the best athletes in the world and you have a large disposable pool of them, what do you do? More extreme measures were going to be the things that got more extreme results. If you want to summarize the development of weightlifting from the 1960s through the end of the 1980s in one word, it could easily be this, more. That was the driver of results, and not just in these two countries. Eventually, at some point in the 80s, Bulgarian lifters were just training more than everybody else. Ivan's approach was to limit touches below 90% for his athletes, and he fixated on the front squat, the clean and jerk, and the snatch almost exclusively as they were the most specific exercises to competing. His aim was maximum specificity. Along with cutting other widely used assistance exercises, he prioritized daily PRs, not maximums, PRs, even at the expense of sound technical execution. Now this is Max Aida's take on it. Max Aida, who was associated with Juggernaut for a long time, uh, trained under Ivan Abijia for quite a while. We're gonna define it as uh, near maximum or maximum attempts um, with a high frequency every day or multiple times per day with no planned rests, no planned deloads. How many max squats have, do you think you've actually squatted in your life? Uh, you know, there was a point where I tried to count up how many times I had done at least 600, and I, there was a maybe six-month period where I squatted 600 every single workout, at least three workouts a day. So the program was three workouts per day, every day, to a max in three lifts. If this sounds brutal, it's because it was. It was an exceptional measure which was required for a country with so few people to stand out on the world stage. Stefan Botov was an Olympic medalist who trained under Ivan. Uh, if I do today the max, my clean and jerk is 240, I do 247 times. So that means that you would do a maximum effort lift maybe 50 times a day? Eight, yeah, 50, 50 between 50 and 60 times, yeah, maximum. <laughs> Antonio Krastev also trained under Ivan and snatched 216 kilos in 1987, which was the all-time world record for quite a while. He also lived with and directly mentored John Bros of Average Bros Gym in Las Vegas. John gained popularity about a decade ago when he was training Pat Mendez, who squatted 800 pounds, no, no, no style, ass to grass at 20 years old. John emphasizes need when explaining to people what they can adapt to and frequently uses the garbage man analogy, comparing lifting to a day job that, while taxing at first, will become run of the mill eventually. And it has to, because you don't have a choice, you don't have an option in quitting. A career, the thing you are paid by your country to do, is not the same as something you do as a hobby in the first world. They say, okay, here's another situation. You're in Alcatraz. You're locked in a cell that's so short you can't even stand up on a bed you don't even fit on. Right? It's all dark. And all your family and loved ones are in adjacent cells, and they're never allowed out of their cells. You have 30 days to squat a certain amount of weight to put 100 pounds on your squat. The only time you're allowed out of your cell is to train. Do you think ah. you're going to train twice a week? And as soon as you ask people that question, how often would you train under these circumstances? Well, fuck, I would train every day. Well, why? Well, because I need to. Right. Now, there's also a big downside here. Aside from the physical wear and the low likelihood of anybody sustaining this method long enough to get good in the first place, there are the dark times. It's purported to be a period of depression and disillusionment while the body is adapting to the unceasing rush of stress hormones. 
It's been said that the adrenal glands of these lifters were actually shown to have increased in size in order to deal with the stress. So it's a holistic approach to the organism adapting. It's not just muscles and nerves. Now, what they don't tell you, one, the lifters were advanced before going into this. Getting to this iteration of the Bulgarian system came after you had spent your years learning the lifts and working in more traditional training ranges, 70 to 80%. It was only when you had achieved the status of a specialized advanced lifter, meaning that your base was set, that you would even attempt something like this. Even the Bulgarians would not have their novice or intermediate athletes train like this. Two, it was based on need, not want. Olympic sports in other countries are not like recreational lifting. It is a job that you get paid to do, and for many, is the best chance of improving economic status. According to Mark Ripito and Practical Program, as a weightlifting regimen, this kind of program works when it has sufficient numbers of available athletes, enough that it can simply replace the ones who can't function within the training paradigm dictated by the coach's particular periodization model. So that's basically to say that the system doesn't change for you and your needs. You change the system or you don't succeed at all. U.S. kids play sports to get in shape, while kids in Soviet-type systems get in shape to play sports. In the former bloc country, sport was one of the few ways to rise above the cram feints of the economic system, and this was a very powerful motivator. The difference is fundamental and significant, creating two distinct populations of athletes that reflect two distinct cultures. You may turn your nose up and think you go just as hard as the rest of them. You don't. Ignoring that is setting yourself up for failure. The third thing they don't tell you is that application to a group is different than application to an individual. Individuals in an Olympic team are somewhat expendable. If you have a large group of lifters, you have the luxury of breaking a few in the search for the best three or four. If you want to find out what is sustainable for you, you have to pay attention to your limitations. It is not in your best interest to assume you are one of the durable ones. So what is the fixation with the Bulgarian system? Why would anybody want to do this? I mean, there's a competitive edge. You have the best athletes fighting it out on the world stage. So the edge goes to those who are able to work the most while surviving. But the cloud is shared by the winner and the nation they represent in that scenario. No one sings a ballad for the ones who are casualties of the meat grinder. It does represent a challenge, and many people cite that they just want to try something that sounds extreme. While there's a character-building quality to testing your metal against something that is objectively tough, lifting only matters as a long-term pursuit. I've gotten many a migraine over lifters justifying really, really reckless methods because challenge. That shouldn't fly as a rationale. There's ego, which I think is a big driving motivator. People like maxing out. It's fun. It's why so many of us do it as unsupervised high school lifters. And it's also why so many rotator cuffs have been sacrificed to the bench press gods. And then there's attention. It's different, and people respond to different. We have Ivan Jurek, who's gotten popular. And it's in no small part to his thoughtful introspection on lifting and his buttery English accent. He's someone with a medical background. He has a keen understanding of human physiology. He spends a lot of his videos solving his own anatomical issues in real time. Those functions start to let go. We get hip flexion and we get hip internal rotation, which is exactly what we need to get into. But there's no doubt that the thing that sets Ivan apart to his followers is his commitment to squatting every single day. The fact of the approach being unconventional gives it a mystery and people want to see how it plays out. The daily vlog gives people a direct window to his personal wins and losses on a timeline that fits their limited attention span. And in scrolling through a lot of Ivan's videos, uh, it looked as if he was starting uh, his endeavor almost three years ago. I think he's like almost a thousand days in. It's like 950 days in or something. And he started with an all-time best of, I think, 190 kilos. And as of his most recent post is current PR is 212. So he's put somewhere on the order of 45 pounds on his max in about three years. Now that's not bad. That's not bad progress by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also not rare progress for somebody running any other type of system that doesn't take so much time. So there has to be some honest evaluation if doubling or tripling the amount of work you do throughout the week to get the same result is actually warranted, or if there are other motivations for doing something like that. Now, watered-down Bulgarian-inspired approaches, like the one Ivan follows, have become somewhat popular. These types of programs modify the initial Bulgarian framework specifically to make a high-intensity, high-frequency approach tolerable to the masses. Greg Knuckles and Omar Isaf put out the Bulgarian Light Manual, and one of the things they do a really good job of is highlighting exactly what made the Bulgarian system work and how their method is different. In order to recover and have a life, as the manual says, it prescribes sets working up to daily training maxes, not absolute maxes, it doesn't mandate daily practice, and it actively discourages arousal and form breakdown. But in doing that, it retains Bulgarian as a title, 
as a buzzword while eliminating what actually made the program work for all of the champions it produced. There's a lot of putting the word Bulgarian system or doing the Bulgarian training in front of something that is a modification of it. When you modify it, you diminish what it was originally. And if you modify it to, sm to a small degree, why not just modify it to a bigger degree? And if you're going to modify it to a big degree, why not just do something that makes more sense from a, a you know, different from a perspective of the scientific principles, right? There's kind of a paradox here. Very, very few people really squat every day. And the fact that nobody really does it is what makes it seem like sort of a hidden trick. The fact that it isn't as productive as other methods directly contributes to its mass appeal. Just because something you came up with shares a few features of a successful approach doesn't mean that your new method gets to share the old one's reputation. These methods of training are unproven, untested. They take no credit for the meteoric rise of any lifter anywhere. You won't find a top 100 powerlifter, bodybuilder, or strongman who squats every day or does anything that looks like Bulgarian light. Sure, improvements will come as reckless training is better than none, but there is an opportunity cost. Squatting every day robs you of the opportunity to give equal attention to other lifts. Even if we guess that it works as good as more traditional splits, you have to reconcile the fact that you are tripling your training time throughout the week to get the same results and take attention from other things. High frequency auto-regulated programs that are actually not that uncommon. My two shear is a good example of those types of programs, but they fundamentally don't share any important features with the Bulgarian system. The things that make those programs work, that they focus on to be successful, are diametrically opposed to what the Bulgarians prioritize. They are as different as the original Soviet approaches that the Bulgarians strive to set themselves apart from. If you are the type of person who has to try it out for yourself, I don't fault you. I was in the same boat. I tried my hand at it when I was a wee Bromley, and I made it about eight days before my patellar tendonitis became absolutely unbearable. If you are going to do it, have realistic expectations. Don't go into it expecting to find some unknown hack to lifting world record weights because this isn't going to be that. So let me know what you guys think. Have you read the Bulgarian Light Manual? Have you tried your hand at squatting every day? Are you a follower of someone like Ivan Jurek? What do you think of their approach? Do you think it's worthwhile? And I'd actually be really eager to hear from anybody that has tried it or still does it and has had a lot of success with it. So go ahead and leave your comments in the comment box. And guys, if you're interested in seeing how I put my own training together, go ahead and check out my Patreon. I'm putting together five minute long summaries of my training that involves every main working set and thorough discussion of how I structure my training and what I'm doing in real time. And this is going to carry me into the contest that I have coming up this year. So if you want to see training happen in real time, join my Patreon because we have some good content going up there. We also have a really good community of people that contribute and provide questions and give feedback. So uh, I strongly recommend you check that out for training templates, for coaching, or to get my books, go ahead and check out empirebarbellstore.com. I appreciate everybody's support. Thanks so much. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.